This is the Pfeffer on Power podcast, Accelerating Your Career. I'm Jeffrey Pfeffer, the host. Every other week, we have on this podcast somebody to talk about an aspect of influence and power that has accelerated their career, that they've used to get where they are, and to share with you the lessons of power and influence. And today, I am thrilled and excited to be joined by Christina Troitino. I met Christina when she was a student in my class. Christina was and is amazing. We're going to talk to her today about breaking the rules and about shamelessness and about her career. She is at the moment the Director of Strategy and Operations for Morning Brew, which is owned by Axel Springer. It is a startup organization. She has left YouTube, which is the first job she had after her graduation, which occurred in 2020. So she actually just graduated since you can't graduate during the, um, she got a diploma, but she actually went through graduation since you couldn't graduate um, during the pandemic. Uh, welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast, Christina. It's great to see you again. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is going to be an absolute blast. Always so excited to talk about all of this. So let's begin by giving people a little sense of who you are, because um, as you told me when you were in the class, you had come from a Hispanic background. I think your family is in Venezuela, and you had been active in the Hispanic Student Association. So tell a little bit about that part of your background and what you had done prior to coming to Stanford. Yeah, definitely. So I'm originally from Albany, New York, uh, but I was from a hometown that was largely not Hispanic minority in any sense of the word. So already growing up kind of felt kind of the difference in where people come from and like their power and how that stands and how that impacts their whole lives, really. And so growing up, most of my family was living in Venezuela. Most recently, they've more migrated to Spain. But that being said, growing up with the context of the Hugo Chavez regime in your background is really a, a good context for understanding about really how unfair the world can be. And I think just like having that in mind while I got to grow up more directly in a very safe space, um, in a safe community, I think made me kind of prepared for once I actually was at college to hit the ground running. But be aware of the power constructs that kind of exist out there and really not feel ashamed whenever I'm in a place where I feel like something might feel quote unquote unfair. It's more of acceptance that that's kind of how the world is. And so I should say before the GSB, otherwise I'd worked at large and small tech companies. And I think one of the most important experiences I had was my first job out of undergrad. I worked at Amazon and I was on the team that got profiled by the New York Times and the amazing journalist Jody Cantor, who won the Pulitzer Prize for the Me Too movement later on. But effectively, I got to see firsthand mismanagement and what happens when employees are basically not treated their best to effectively move forward the goals of an organization, which is really that's how most organizations operate because they're there to make money. So I think it was a really important lesson for me early on in my career to, yeah, similar to my childhood, kind of understand that the world's not fair. And so you have to be just mindful of those dynamics. And I think sometimes people get stuck in that first gear and they never get to the second gear, which is acceptance of kind of the rules of the road. And of course, you're famous for my class. Every year, people go off to Sundance, the film festival, and they basically hang out with other Stanford students. And so every year, I challenge the students to go to Sundance and meet somebody that they don't already know. Why travel hundreds of miles to basically hang out with your classmates? And you came back, you sat on my right as I faced the classroom, and you raised your hand and you said, I had dinner with Martha Stewart. And of course, that made you famous because I called on you and you became known as um, you know, the person who actually uh, did. So tell the story of Martha Stewart. And then I want to explore with you a word that you used about yourself that many people would say, think is an insult, but I think you really embrace that word and the word is shameless, a word that you continue to use about yourself. So tell about the Martha Stewart dinner and then we'll talk about shamelessness. Absolutely. So the Martha Stewart story, for context, effectively, I was in your class and I was coming back from Sundance and I think I was either concerned about missing your class and missing like an attendance mark or being late. Some flavor of that it was kind of the impetus. I was like, well, if I sneak this story in, I'm pretty sure that I won't get marked as absent because I was doing real world application of the principles. I don't actually know if I've ever given you that full context of that, but felt important for the full 
context of this story. Um, but effectively, yeah, I, I love movies. I love Sundance, but also um, I've done a lot of freelance writing over the years. And so with that, every time I travel, I try to think of how can I make the most of the trips and the people I can meet when I'm on them. And so Sundance is like the greatest example of that. So while I was very excited to go there with DSB classmates, I was even more excited to see who are the people I can meet while I was there, make the most of my time. And so that being said, there was this amazing organization that every year they put on this dinner that was kind of like a who's who of all these media and industry titans at Sundance. I always wanted to go into it, but I like never really knew like what would be my in. So in this year, they had opened up an interesting event to promote a nonprofit of theirs and it related to food. And I'd been a Forbes contributor on food business for the last few years. And as you pointed out in class once, Jeff, there are literally thousands of people who contribute to Forbes. Like the title in of itself is only as valuable as you make it. But that being said, I kind of knew that. And I was like, okay, how about we figure out our angle in? So what I did was kind of at this point, even like second nature, just sent an email to some generic email address I found on their website. And it was really short, so short that I was trying to position myself as if I was far more powerful than I actually am at, at the time as a GSB student. Effectively, it said, hey, I write for Forbes. I want to come to this dinner. Let me know if I can make one of these dates. And at the time, they had two dinners. One was with uh, Alice Walters, who's an absolute legend, would love to have met her. And another one was for Martha Stewart. I figured... Alice Waters was local to Bay Area, which is where I lived at the time. So in my own back pocket way, I was like, maybe I can figure out another way to meet her while I'm out here. But Martha Stewart seemed like the rarer get. So yeah, basically it was just a series of emails where I kept trying to like make it seem like I was way more important than I actually was. So intentionally even like delaying responses, making a plan saying like they offered me to go to the Alice Waters dinner on a Friday and I pretended I was busy Friday night taking meetings. Obviously I was not, I was hanging out with cheese beers until eventually they got me a spot for the Martha Stewart dinner. But it was an amazing experience. And I should say, it didn't even stop there at the door. I arrived with uh, my partner at the time. We weren't even sure like if he could attend or not. And so showed up at the door with this plus one and effectively they're like, Oh, who's this with you? Um, I said, Oh, well, this is my guest. And they just kind of looked at each other and they're like, okay, sure. So a lot of paths to power elements in there to unpack, but long and short of it was like, I think so many people don't even get off the starting blocks to doing those kind of things that they always want to do. And to me, as a segue into shamelessness, the fact that someone can even like ask that puts them in such better starting ground. That is like, to me, like 90% of the work for any of these situations is literally just asking. Yeah. I like that. You have to ask. Asking is important. You don't get anything that you don't ask for. And so the worst that they could have said at any point in your story is no. And, and there was going to be no if you didn't ask. So why not ask? That's great. So let me ask you, I want to explore shamelessness a little bit more because I think you have embraced the idea of the second rule of power, which is breaking the rules, which you kind of did to get into the Martha Stewart dinner. Many people will think that doing what you did, delaying response, presenting yourself in a more powerful fashion, basically almost all elements of that story, many people, not many people, well, some people at least, will have felt some level of embarrassment or inappropriateness around. So in the context of some of your behavior, Christina, many people would think of you as aggressive or pushy, and as applied to women, not so much to men, those are often seen as pejorative terms. So how would you respond if somebody said, oh, Christina, you're too, too assertive or you're too whatever? How do you think about you and your navigating yourself in this world? Definitely. So I think um, it's interesting. And I think definitely women are more sensitive because no one wants to get that label in the workplace. But that being said, to me, shamelessness, just from the context of my childhood, and I appreciate you bringing it up. To me, it's like you literally won't get anything unless you ask for it in life, like just straight up. No one's incentivized to give you things unless it's in their best interest. And oftentimes people are just too caught up in their own world to deal with the betterment of someone else. So without asking, you simply can't even get from point A to B. But in terms of shamelessness, of course, what I try to center on to your point is like the worst anyone can say to me is no. And just like I, I've talked to students in your class about the more often you get used to asking, 
and like soliciting those things and making yourself feel vulnerable, the less scary it is every time. And so, yeah, I will say for this like Martha event, like, yeah, I'd be lying if I said part of me was like, oh, I might feel embarrassed if this doesn't work out, but that shouldn't be the deterrent for doing it at all. The fact that that is the deterrent and it's something that's, oh, the only thing keeping me back is only like my own headspace about this. That's even more reason to do it. You can manage your own headspace in that regard. And so when I talk to other people about it, it's like shamelessness is like a muscle and you just have to keep developing it over time and keep cranking up those asks that you have of others and the things that you want to do. And it eventually becomes second order. But like most things, it's a fake it till you make it kind of situation. And I should say, too, like, I think it's super important to note that, like, growing up, I was super shy. I still am an introvert, which people are often really shocked by. And just as you've seen with my classmates in the broader GSB community, I don't think most people would consider me like the loudest person by any means. And I think, uh, and I should say in physical stature, I'm obviously a small woman. So I think it's even more important that I go out of my way and get my needs met and ask for those things. Just because, yeah, to your point, I don't think shameless is at all a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. It's really good to be direct and make sure people are aware of, of what you want. Um, and yeah, I, I think shameless is one of the best things you can be described as, but I'm only insanely biased. Yeah, okay. And I love the sense of agency. I think part of what your answer reflects is the idea that if you sit back and wait, particularly as a woman with Latino heritage, particularly as a, small, a woman of small stature, particularly as someone who doesn't necessarily come from an advantaged background, if you wait for the world to deliver you things on a silver platter, you will wait forever. And so you have to be agentic about it. And that, and that I think is what your story really reflects. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the biggest takeaways I even have from the GSB was I went to the GSB thinking everyone was going to be exactly like me and all these people who are willing to like just go out of the way, feel super uncomfortable, and ask for those things. And certainly there is a higher population of that than in most places I've been. But still seeing so many competent and able-bodied people still get in their own heads about those things. It made me really realize that people who can do that, it makes a huge difference. And to me, it's Again, the effort is more dealing with your own emotions and facing the periodic rejections, if at all. Yep. It's getting out of your own way. All right. So tell the quick story then about after the Martha Stewart thing, you also did this thing because um, it's uh, 2020. We got COVID. Everybody is separated. And then you started another initiative. Yeah. So for context, I graduated in the spring of 2020, which is, of course, when the pandemic first materialized and we first went into lockdown and it was my last quarter at the GSB. And so I, like many other folks, was feeling kind of helpless. A lot of type A people with their hands kind of tied behind their back thinking not only, oh, I miss my friends, but also like, can I do things that are like net positive? Like I feel like profoundly not helpful for the world right now in so many ways. And so part of that was we started this thing called Team Positivity Contagion. And it was basically a virtual events platform slash playbook that we activated for the GSB community to host all of these virtual social events to keep us connected. And it worked well. We uh, started thinking this was interesting. We, like we activated this so quickly here. Is this something that like we could take to other top business schools? And I just feel like, I don't know, I think subconsciously I was like, it never hurts to have more friends and more connections and I have the time for it right now. So that was kind of like the spirit of it. We made connections with all these other programs. We started this and by we, I mean, I started a WhatsApp group and we invited all these people and someone had a thought like, it wouldn't it be so cool for us to do like a shared event with all of these schools. We had 10 schools involved in this group and it kind of spiraled into what we now have called the battle Royale which was a 10 school wide fundraiser for Doctors Without Borders. And what was interesting about it was basically no one gave us permission to do any of this. And Stanford as an organization is understandably very protective of its image and how it is in the world. And so in a non COVID time, if you're trying to do anything with a Stanford name on it, you'd have to go through all these offices, get permissions for logos, all that sort of thing. This was kind of a moment where the school is kind of like everything's in chaos we don't have time to deal with this. So I didn't even bother asking for permission. We're going to get out there. We're going to raise all this money. We're going to get all these schools together. And I bet you they won't say anything. And that's exactly what happened. And even beyond that, it just kind of like had this multiplier effect of the tension. We had all these schools involved. I started thinking about once people, I saw like a demand for even this kind of cross school event, this battle royale, thinking, how do we raise even more money than ticket sales? So started doing more of like um, reach out to these MBA meme accounts, one called MBA Mikey, who's a huge fan of yours, Jeff. 
who has hundreds of thousands of followers. And I was like, hey, do you want to be like a promotional partner for this event? So then for literally no budget, we're getting reach of literally millions of people on Instagram for this event. And yeah, it was a total blast. And just like, it's such an interesting way to connect with people from different schools. And I like the story because it was so many paths to power elements, but used in a way that was obviously normatively very good. We raised a lot of money for an amazing organization that is Doctors Without Borders. We connected a lot of really amazing people. I made an incredibly close friend through the experience, a guy named Nick who went to Chicago booth that I otherwise wouldn't know. And lastly, just gave people like something to focus on instead of just like the doom and gloom of the moment. So I could talk your ear off about it, but it was an absolute blast. Thank you. And of course, you were at the center of this. And so you got a lot of credit for doing this, of course, and a lot of networking and a lot of publicity, which is good. And one more final thing, prior to starting the actual podcast, you talked about how you had used past the power techniques to move from your first job to your current job. Talk a little bit about that. How did you pass the power your way to your current position? Yeah. So right after the GSB, I went and I joined YouTube as a strategy and operations lead. And for me, I wanted to go into corporate strategy, but I never really wanted to do the formal consulting experience working at a McKinsey or BCG. I think, Jeff, you know more than probably anyone else that I learned from at the GSB that I probably am not like someone who would love being a tried and true consultant. So I was trying to think, how do I get like the baseline foundation and credibility to do that without having to like go back and have one of those experiences? So I did this and effectively the role is internal consulting for executives. So I was like, if I do this at YouTube, at Google for these executives, that's like experience no one can ever take away from me. So what I tried to do was basically get as much of that experience as quickly as possible and then try to time it to see how can I take this to a smaller company that is in a high growth phase and basically use it as an accelerator for my career to like, again, reach this goal doing corporate strategy without having to like do all of this more traditional experience. And so that being said, now I'm a director of strategy and operations at this company that's already doubled in size since I joined. And I think if I just waited along just to have someone slowly promote me up the ranks at a company like Google, I would have been waiting there forever to be director level. Like you'd have to wait 10, 15 years for that otherwise. So it's been a blast. And funnily enough, as I mentioned before we started, plenty of classmates have been like, wow, good for you. Totally paths to power that move for you. And so the paths to power part was, was how you use the background then. Is there any particular story about how you actually found the job or got the job? Honestly, I just was a huge fan of Morning Brew and had been a longtime reader. And I just saw this role open up. And so I've just reached out to them. So in terms of the actual getting of the job, nothing too paths to powery in that terms, but it's more of the way I angled my background in like interviews and talked about really leaning in on this YouTube experience and kind of even telling my now boss, our COO, that, yeah, pretty much what I told you, I didn't want to go and have the traditional consulting background, but I wanted to give you the most excellent experience you could ever have to do this job successfully, which I think definitely when uh, you're competing with a room full of McKinsey graduates, you have to very carefully position yourself in that way. Yeah. And so part of the story is you are willing to promote yourself. And self-promotion, I you know, I think is a positive thing. I mean, if you don't speak for yourself, you who else will? And again, this also, your story of getting this job at the Morning Brew also speaks to your agency. So talk about your agency and self-promotion and how you've gotten comfortable with that. Definitely, and I think anyone who's ever worked with me knows that I talk in like a very specific Christina language filled with like a lot of expressions that I've like just made up and then they like become part of an organization that we're in. So bear with me on a couple of these. But the first one I always say is, I'm the horse in the race that I bet on. You have to be so boldly confident in yourself always, because if you're not, no one else is going to buy it. So I always try to approach new situations and challenges from that perspective. And I think the more common sentiment shared at places like the GSB is kind of If not anyone else, why not me? Or I should say, I totally butchered that. But effectively, why not me to do this thing? And I think it's like, those two are always really important just because it's like, you have to be blindly confident in yourself, um, but also visualize yourself being the one getting these opportunities and these things that you want to see actually happen. So people get in their head about shamelessness, like you have to be of like a traditional background, like a more privileged background. I think when we think of that, we think of a loud, obnoxious, tall, white, cisgender male man. And so I always think to myself, well, 
maybe my power can be just kind of going under the radar and getting my needs met in a way that people have no idea about. I think it's all about like how you contextualize it too. Th thank you so much. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast. I'm Jeffrey Pfeffer, your host. Every other week, we talk to an amazing individual to tell you their story. I hope if you're interested in this podcast, you will subscribe. Follow me on jeffreypfeffer.com. That is Jeffrey, P-F-E-F-F-E-R.com. And um, follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. And today we have been talking to Christina Troitino. Christina uh, tells her story about shamelessness, about agency, about surmounting a background. Thank you so much for being with us today, Christina. Thank you so much for having me. It's always an absolute blast.